Okay, let's talk about Linux. <laughs> let's move on. Motivation for this talk. I'm an incident responder. I'm a blue tie teamer by heart. And every time I'm, I'm doing an investigation, I think, or oh, that keeps me awake at night. Do I really see all the back doors, traces left by the attackers? I am really capable enough to see everything the attacker has done. Maybe not, most probably not. <laughs> so that's, that's what's really the motivation for this talk, to really deep dive into Linux internals, about Linux rootkits, see the points I'm missing and whatnot. About me, I'm Stefan Burke, my nickname is Malmö. Everybody calls me Malmö, feel free to do the same. Um, as I said before, I'm doing most of the time just incident response, doing research. I blog about that stuff on dfir.ch and also Twitter regularly. Follow me and look up my posts if you're interested in, in more blue team stuff. A short history of Linux rootkits, that's really a short topic here or a short, a short introduction about the history of that rootkit. The interesting part we will see later in the slides is that some of these techniques introduction 20 years plus ago are still useful today and abused by attackers. So we as defenders, so I'm speaking here as a blue teamer, we haven't made that much progress to defend against these tactics and procedures by the attackers, which I think is just hilarious, just given the time frame that 20 years later, these techniques, at least in user space code, are still, yeah, they are still working as they did uh, two decades ago. The current landscape we are facing as defenders is this one here, that screenshot is from a, an actual paper from, from a research conducted by the Fraunhofer Institute, so the German, the German research fac faculty. What we are seeing on the top is the user land rootkits, the name of the user land rootkits, and on the top, starting in the middle of the screenshot, the kernel space rootkits. In the middle, we see the hooking techniques. One of these famous hooking techniques are LD preload. We will talk about these techniques in length. The other techniques, techniques you should be at least familiar with are K hooks, F trace, eBPF, and whatnot. I personally think at least when you are conducting incident response or forensic investigation on Linux boxes, you should be at least be familiar with those names and be familiar with where to find traces of the exploitation and installments of these rootkits. Otherwise, if you're just looking for cron chops or bash history tampering or whatever, you will miss a ton. I can, um, I can promise you that one. Let's start with the basic application level rootkits. That one here was um, discussed in 2002 in a Sun's paper. It's called, it's called the Torn Rootkits. Back in the days, it was enough for an attacker just to swap out the binaries, like PS, LSOF, whatever. Just swap the binary, place your code for the hiding, so that your malicious process was, was hidden from the legitimate tool on the system. I personally thought, when I first started this presentation in August or September, that's way way old, or that's really, really old. <laughs> see the, see this quote here from the Aqua block from this, this month. So it's still used today. So given the fact that most Linux boxes I investigate that don't have like an EDR agent or like, um, a file integ integrity agent that might be still working today. So as long as you as an incident responder don't bring your own tools or your own forensic agent to the box and just doing live forensics on a Linux box, you might be missing some critical artifacts and some critical traces by the attackers. Keep that in mind. Userland rootkits. Why is this talk relevant? That was also my motivation for this talk. It is super relevant, as we see here. So, for example, the SSL rootkit was used by different red actors. Um, as written on the Chronicle blog, Intercept blog, Unit 42 blogs over the last few years. Same goes for other rootkits, user level rootkits, Symbioti by Intercept, Orbit, B Devil, Unit 42 again, Tramp Micro, also blocked about the Burke rootkit. So keep that also in mind. We as defenders, we are really fighting against capable adversaries here, which are using you rootkits on user land and also in kernel space, as we will see later on. It's not enough just to rely on typical 
um, let's say, examination tools and scripts, some bash scripts, you, may, you might have coded in the past, which do live forensics, that's not enough. So the first technique I want to present you is LD preload. That was a technique really presented 20 plus years ago, and it's still used by these Rusland. <laughs> you kids, you are nodding in the first row. <laughs> you know what I'm speaking about. So what we are doing here, we are hacking or hijacking the flow of execution. So because we are loading our malicious library first, we can, as attacker, hijack every function call on a Linux box, given we are using or just living on user space. This is because the preload library will take precedence over any of the other shared libraries. Um, this is really a, rec a good recommendation if you all want to dig deeper in this topic, learning Linux binary analysis by Ryan O'Leal, which will really dig deep into EL the L format and also Linux techniques and to hook Linux, <laughs> all these functions. As a demonstration, what I did here, I'm hooking the right function, the Linux system call right can be hooked with a simple library. What I'm doing here, the code doesn't really matter. If you're really interested, you can watch the talk later on and really zoom in, or I can give you the source code. What I'm doing here is every time the word rocks appear in a text file and printed to the console is replaced with the word sucks. How does that work? So first, cat statement, D4 rocks. Yes, it does. <laughs> I, love, I love my job, I love the blue team. Now we are loading our malicious library called the key, keyword swap .so. .so is a, um, a shared object file on Linux, so a malicious library. When we are loading that library and executing cat again, our library will hook or hijack the right call and swap magically the word rocks with sucks. The same technique can be used for every system call. So you cannot trust the output of your tools on a backdoored or tampered Linux system. This is really powerful. When we export that environment variable, so that it means here the, the, um, this, the malicious library was only loaded once we execute a specific command. Once we export that library, that means on every command run on the system, the library will be loaded in our process. When we are seeing that here with LDD, list dynamic dependencies on our Linux box, we see that our malicious binary is loaded in the process. This might be one way to find such loaded libraries, but again, you cannot depend on it because once an attacker got a foothold on the Linux box, it could be possibly game over, and you cannot trust the tools anymore. These here are the function hooks from a, also a known rootkit. It's called Father Rootkit, and you see how many system calls get hooked by that rootkit. We are not only talking about the right function here. We see like fopen, accept, open dear, pam, get it. PAM get item. PAM is the authentication library from Linux. So most probably for setting a pass, uh, for setting a backdoor on the Linux system. The next thing is what we saw before is that we just use um, the environment variable LD preload for loading our shared library, but it can also be used for patching the loader. So what you're seeing here is from the uh, from the rootkit Bedevil, which used a technique called patching the loader, which replaced the path to the LD preload file with a malicious path. And you will not see traces of tampering on the file system. We'll come to that later on, where I show you the detection techniques to find such stuff. This technique here, a lib process hider, an open source tool you can find on GitHub, was also used by APTs to remain stealth on boxes or, or compromised systems. Again, this technique here um, in, the, in the red rectangle does use the LD preload technique to inject a malicious library into the process. Very, very stealthy. If you don't know where to look at, it's really obvious when you know how it works and how to find it. Which brings us to the next topic, detection. Audit. When we saw, so the, the first 
files here, the etc, ldso preload files, these files are responsible for loading libraries during a process start. That must not be malicious in all time, but it could be malicious. So once you see that a file or a, pro or a process writes to one of these files or tampering with one of these files, you might want to check the contents of the file because it could point to a malicious library. Periodically check the slash proc slash PID slash environment which holds all the environment variables on the system. What we saw before, that a rootkit can use the environment variable, LD preload, to load a malicious file on runtime. You might find traces there. And last but not least, has anyone tampered with my loader? I recently published a blog on my on my, um, on my blog, <laughs> a blog post on my blog, which goes really into detail how an adversary can tamper with a loader. It's a complex technique, so I don't have much time here, so if you're really interested in a topic, please read it up, hit me up later if you wanna do a chat about it. Unhide is another open source tool, also hosted on GitHub, which you can use to find some discrepancies on your file system. What rootkits typically da, do or is they try to hide from our typical tools like PS, LSOF, and whatnot. If you have ever done an PS or an S-trace on PS, you see that all these tools which list the open files, which list the process on a Linux system, just traversing through slash proc, iterating through every file there or every, every directory. What unhide does, or the rootkit does, so the rootkit does, let's say the rootkit have the, the process number five. And when I go to PS and I'm looking for the process ID five, that gets hidden by the rootkit. What unhide does in that case here, it really tries to access it directly, just brute forcing all the numbers within slash proc to find some hidden processes there. That might work in some cases, some rootkits are are mostly or more clever than that. In my tests, I've conducted a lot of tests here. What really worked well against use 11 rootkits was the use of static binaries. Because in our latest checks, LD preload loads or just links. Let's say I use the, the right system call. The right system calls get dynamically looked up during the execution and points to a library within my kernel that's dynamically executed. So means I can hijack that also dynamically. When I bring a static binary to my Linux system, that whole write system call or the write function is baked into my, is, is baked into my program. And an adversary don't have the chance to hijack that system call. What you see here is that with a simple LSOF, I cannot find my my bad process with a statically linked process, I can see my process. That's the whole power here. It's really powerful. I've conducted, as I said before, several tests with static binaries and it worked pretty well. Another really pretty thing I thought is, coming back to our cat statement thing, on the upper hand we see LD preload keyword swap cat statement, D4 still sucks. But when I do um, an LD preload XXD statement, so XXD is the hex, print it in hex, please, I get the output. So the, the rootkit is not able to swap our text. And then I thought, oh, that's interesting, why? I personally, I love s -trace. If you're following my blog and my Twitter account, you know how much I love s -trace. I s -trace the execution of XXD, and what we are seeing here is the output of XXD, is in different characters, so the character encoding is different, and it's not what the rootkit is expecting. The rootkit, the function which I hooked, expect the string rocks. And what we are seeing here is just a different encoding, and Bash know how to, how to deal with a different encoding and replace it afterwards presenting to us. So that might be also a technique you could use to, to find evil on your system, just using different, different system. If cat doesn't return a, retu a result from a file, just use XXT, use VI, use whatever. Coming to the kernel space rootkits. Again, it's relevant, diamorphine, group IB, decoded, and CrowdStrike in the last couple of uh, years. 
22, 24, it's really relevant. Reptile again, Man Mandiant, Microsoft, Mandiant again. Just so you know, I'm not talking like, <laughs> it's not, it's not me who really find that topic interesting. It's really, it's really something you should have uh, um, on your radar. The next big thing, PBF door, ePBF. Somebody knows that. We will talk about that. If you haven't heard that term, look it up. That will be the future of the rootkit. How do we bring our code, our malicious code, to the kernel? A technique called loadable kernel modules is heavily used by adversaries. This one here is also interesting because the same paper which I discussed before from the application level swapping from 2002 also discussed loadable kernel modules. Over 20 plus years later, we are still using that technique to bring malicious code to the kernel. There are techniques I can prevent and I can harden my kernel, my Linux kernel, but that's not standardly or deep by default baked into a Linux kernel. We as defender, we still have to pay attention to all that stuff. The next big technique also which I can use as an adversary to bring my code to the Linux kernel is eBPF. It's called extended Berkeley packet filter. Back in the days, eBPF was mostly used for sniffing traffic um, on the network. Now it's got extended Berkeley packet filter. And you can see here that with, with the power of eBPF, I can mostly attach to every place in the Linux kernel I want as an adversary. Not only as an adversary, also as a blue teamer, because one of the lightning talks was, was about Kunai, a security solution, which extensively also use EPPF to track system calls on the Linux system. EPPF is so powerful, I can write really short code snippets. Oof, Wi-Fi popped up. I don't see it. Sorry. <laughs> Give me a sec. The, the Wi-Fi from the from the hotel popped up. Okay. <laughs> These EPPF codes get compiled on the fly and really injected in the kernel at runtime. It's a super powerful technique. Um, it's considered the next generation of rootkits. So as defenders and blue teamers, be aware of EPPF. Let's talk about the different hooking techniques. One of the most popular techniques and most well-known techniques is called system table modification. Again, we are just hooking the flow here. So we overwriting the system, the syscall pointers in the syscall table, like we did on our, on our malicious library, but not on the fly, but we just modification on the, on the syscall table. Really easy to spot. The next thing here is, is a called a technique called ftrace. And with ftrace, I can also hook into the kernel at various trace points. I pasted here a little snippet of such an ftrace function. And I think it's really impressive. But all I have to do as an attacker, I just define a new structure, ftrace hook, hooked functions. And I just name the, the, the function of of the syscall I want to hook and also replace it with a hooked function. Uh, that means every time that function gets called on my Linux kernel, I can replace it with my hooked function. This is really powerful. How would you detect that thing when you're just relying on static binaries on your Linux system? This one here is also from a, from a well-known rootkit. It's called Umbra. This called to be hooked using ftrace. We see sys get dense, that means or that system call is used for iterating directories on files on Linux system. So every time a file, or you do an ls, or print working directory, or whatever, and these files are touched by your rootkit, it will get hidden by the output. So again, you will not see it on a live response. This one here is also interesting, khook, it's a different hooking technique. Works pretty much the same as the ftrace hooks, just define a hook, khook. This one here is the rootkit hooks the syscall system call. So every time I try to kill a process by, um, which is owned by the rootkit, the rootkit detects that system call that I want to kill the process and return no process or process group can be found corresponding to that specif specified by PID. 
So that means I don't have really a choice or I cannot really kill the process unless I kill the hook first. So it's kind of a chicken egg problem. EPPF, like I said before, it's super, super powerful. I could talk for two hours about EPPF alone. If you haven't heard the term, I really recommend you to watch this DEF CON presentation by Pat and also his corresponding GitHub page. It gives you really a good introduction how powerful EPPF is and how much you can do with it. Um, again, to wrap up this section here about the hooking techniques, EPPF, it's really easy as also defining a technique, so a couple of lines of code are enough, and I define my hooking point into the kernel. This one here is this enter open at t, and then at, at the bottom of the slide, execut executable name is test, log event, perform additional checks to do anything else. So again, as an attacker, if I can load eBPF probes on the system, I can do pretty much do whatever I want, because I have full power. Yes, deduction. Kernel tating is really a thing. That means when you as an attacker bring a module which is not signed by the, by the vendor, be it SUSE or Red Hat or whatever, that might taint your kernel. The kernel says, somebody loaded a module which is not signed by me. I cannot trust the system anymore that it's stable. This tainting leaves a message in the D message. That's the kernel message ring buffer. And you might find it on the right hand side is from the Sandfly Linux tool, which also detect the same technique there. So if you are logging system events from your Linux systems, watch out for this event here. Diamorphine rootkit also hooks on different functions. These are located, or we can see them in slash sys, slash kernel, slash tracing, slash available filter functions. Of course, we could alter the source code of the rootkit, that it doesn't stand out like a sour dump here, but still, on most systems, it's unlikely that you would see so many hooked functions here. So it's really, to find evil, you must know what's normal is, right? So if you ever have conducted the sun's training, they teach you that all the time. So when you are just looking at a normal, a regular, non-infected Linux system, you most probably will see three to four, I don't know, hooked system calls in that folder, and an infected system will, will have plenty of it. So that might be an indicator that somebody tampered with your system. EBPF kit monitor, a really, really cool thing to detect EBPF root kits. It monitors sys calls and can show you if something is amiss here. Of course, again, that's the same discussion that the red side also keeps up with the research and they have found techniques which they could hide the system calls or the VBPF probes from such a, from such a kit here, like EPPF kit. So again, it's system, it's a chicken and egg problem. But then again, we have to stop, uh, we have to start somewhere as defender. So better use that here and rely on that the adversary might have made um, an error and we are still able to catch them. One of the really impressive thing was while conducting this research is that Linux kernel runtime guard. That's one of the things I said before. It's not impossible to defend Linux boxes against threats. It's still not baked in as default. It's still not the default configuration by most vendors. <laughs> Somebody conducted a research, wrote, wrote a master paper about it. And the, the most impressive thing is, while doing this master thesis, we found out that LR, LKRG is capable of finding most of the root kits. In particular, in particular, when LKRG is loaded before the root kit, it detected eight out of nine kernel root kits tested. Amongst them, Diamorphine and Reptile. So the two root kits also saw by Mandy and by Microsoft and by other big players on the market. It's really easy as, <laughs> easy in quotes, as just downloading the tar file and loading it, the kernel module with the insmod, and immediately you will see an output that somebody tampered with your system or that a rootkit is active on your system. In best case, killing the rootkit on your system. So 
You should check that out in your lab, but when doing insulin response, that might be a really good approach. You have to discuss that with the client to bring a, um, a module on the system, but it could really show, show you how the attacker tampered with the system. Also, BBPF probe write user. So using BBPF probe write user, anything that gets sent or received as a user space buffer can be altered. That's really, really powerful. And the kernel developers knew that it's powerful. It's so powerful that I said, once that eBPF function is used, rewrite a message to the kernel message buffer so that you might get a chance to um, ob observe it or give you a chance to see it. What you're seeing here again, warlock messages, of course, the message. What I thought interesting is that Elasticsearch, I'm not blaming them, it's just interesting because I, I love that repository for, for searches and for queries. They don't have a detection for that one. In contrast, signal, the signal rules have a detection rule for that one. So we also heard a call this morning about Signal. So shout out. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Memory forensic, again, volatility, volatility tree has really, really capable plugins for finding EPPF stuff and also kernel, kernel level rootkits. So if you are dealing with advanced adversaries, it might be a good idea to, to take a memory snapshot and to use volatility to find threats there. Yep, I'm wrapping up. Thank you. That's the last slide. Last slide. Overview of tools. Um, I just presented some manual techniques. The top, the first top two are Archie Hunter, Xiao Rookit. These are all tools. One of the most impressive tools I think up to date is Tracy by Aqua Security, which is also capable of like tracking system calls and also finding rookets on your system. Oof, that was fast paced. <laughs> Thank you so much. Still one minute left. <laughs> I'm sure nobody has a question to this, right? <laughs> You're blown away, it was too fast. <laughs> oh, we do have one. Hi. Um, in, uh, as far as I've seen, um, most kernel level rootkits um, mainly uh, hook the, the uh, get DNs and um, related functions yes. just to hide uh, specific files exactly. as instructed by user space. And they, uh, this can also be used to hide the processes. Um, have you seen any, um, any techniques, um, how those can be detected? Detected? I have seen that, uh, Sandfly, um, have, um, just pushed an update and they claim they can, uh, detect diamorphine and, and reptile. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was how to detect it. Yeah. It really depends, it really depends on the hooking technique. Mm -hmm. Like I saw before, um, kernel tating, for example, sys uh, slash sys slash trace there, and whatever reasons. So, or some tools, for example, like Tracy, they go to the system call table and make sure that the, the, the system call entry was not tampered with. Anything behavior-wise, so that uh, the the hook sys calls behave differently than the original ones? You could use it, like I also showcased you in the slides, use CAT, use VI, use different tools, PSOF versus LSOF. Oh, fuck you as well. <laughs> I'm, just too, I'm just an instant responder. I'm not, I don't have any, any ties to a company, so. I also know and work for Tracy or Aqua Security, <laughs> full disclosure. <laughs> All right, um, we are over time, so if no more questions, if you do have, please take them outside, and we can move to today's last talk, but let's give Melmy a thank you.